Hello and welcome to this look at methods and rules for the study of cities. Uh, as we go through this lecture today, you're, you're going to understand that, that this is important for three reasons. One, we want to be able to better understand the validity and arguments that the theorists that we cover in this class will make. Uh, two, we want to make sure that when you conduct your research and field work, that you're following these guidelines to make sure that your evidence is accurate, that your statements of fact are true, and that uh, what you're putting together is a reliable piece of work. And the third reason this is important is because outside of this course, outside of social theories on urbanization and your take um, on, on these theories, these methods and rules will help us better understand how information is presented and the validity of arguments, the, the reliability of information that, that we digest. So I think as we go through, not only are we going to be able to better make sense of the theorists that we cover in this course, but we're also going to apply these rules to our own work so that we could better our arguments, again, not just in this class, but overall in our education. And three, so that, again, we could better understand information that's swirling around. We could better digest statements of fact or information that is presented as statements of fact. So when we look at methodology, we're going to ask ourselves why. Again, building on what we've discussed already or what's been presented already, we need guidelines, not just theories, to, to support and understand claims. What this means is that we can't just take a class like this, learn about theories, think about how people understood cities, and, and leave it at that. Right? We need guidelines. We need to understand how to approach cities, how to understand what is being presented through our own lens, through our own experiences in the field, through our own interactions. So the, the methodology or the guidelines will help us support and understand these claims. So when Jane Jacobs talks about trust or Richard Florida talks about the creative class, we don't want to just leave that in, in um an abstract nature. We want to be able to embrace that and connect that and digest that in our day-to-day -day lives. So through this methodology, we're going to be better able to observe and judge what we see. Right? Part of a, a liberal arts education or just simply learning in a liberal arts class is the idea that what's happening around us is an unpredictable chaos. Right? We're able to, to understand. We're able to digest. We're able to better comprehend what we're seeing, what our eyes are telling us. So through these um, methodologies and through these approaches and these sets of rules, we're going to be better at observing and judging what we see. So when we see issues like poverty, when we see issues like redevelopment, when we see social change, when we see economic development, we're going to better be able to understand what's happening, both through a theoretical lens of, of an author, of a social scientist, and through what we're seeing. So the, the result of this will be empirical and theoretical conclusions. Theoretical, being able to understand, explain a situation through the theories put forth by um, the social scientists and the, the urban scholars we've discussed, and empirical. What is the evidence on the ground that supports this? What is the evidence that you're uncovering to support the claim that this phenomena is present. So now that we have the, the, the why, we can look at the how. And there are, there are two key ways to, to social science or to conduct social science. The first is validity. We want a valid argument. Anything that is presented as true should be valid. So validity looks at authentic information. Is it real? Right? Um, can we make these valid judgments on what's happening in front of us? And in order to, to support validity, right, we need more than just word of mouth. We need more than just a simple one-time experience. We could um, spend five minutes in a place and have a completely uncommon experience. We could spend days in a place and have a, 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 a predictable experience. So what we want to do with validity is make sure that it's not just a simple one-time event that you happen to encounter. That what you're saying is true of a place is actually authentic. 
It's not just what someone told you about a place. Oh, that, that neighborhood is fun, it's expensive, it's dangerous, right? That's word of mouth. How much validity does that hold? So we want to dig in. We want to better understand these places, not just from a simple one-time passing observation, not just from driving and looking out the window or holding your smartphone to snap pictures, right? That's not validity. That is just simply um, casual observations. So validity, authentic information. We want to do more than just a simple, quick interaction more than just a simple quick recommendation or word of mouth explanation of a place. We want objective evidence. Objective, not subjective, objective. So when we when we state conclusions, when we state facts, when we state what's happening, authentic information, it needs to be supported. So when you do field work, you need observations. You need additional support, right? It's not just what your eyes are telling you because we're not spending enough time in the field to, to explain something thoroughly. So we need our observations as one piece of the puzzle. We need a, a combination of other um, evidence. It could come through interviews, right? Not just one person that you pass, but somebody who may know a place. We need stats. Right. If you're if you're telling me that a place is gentrifying, you better have more than just the new businesses or trendy places opening up. We need stats. We need historical facts. So how has this place changed over time? What did this place used to be? Remember that importance of place, right? The meaning of a location, um, different um, neighborhoods, different communities, different parts of our cities change over time. Know the historical before you make a comparison to the present or multiple examples so if you want to um, make a statement right support it at least three examples to, to make that work so when we, we when we push validity it has to be authentic and, and authenticity doesn't come from simple casual observations or word of mouth learning it comes from embracing engaging the material um, getting out um, encountering the um, the community that you that you're that you're studying that you're researching that you're photographing. What's not validity? Random websites. Uh, most likely a Google search may give you a little information, but it's not providing validity. It's not providing it. Um, again, the idea that that subjective or limited observations could be used to support val valid arguments is not there. And biasness, right? It's difficult, I understand that, for, for me, for you, for everybody to have a completely unbiased view of a place. But we need to um, understand our, our biases as we, as we engage the material to keep that objective state. Um, because if we go into something with, a, with an agenda, with the bias, it's going to limit the validity of an argument. Our second key is what's known as reliability. And reliability simply means, can we replicate these results, right? So we could go in with, with, with objective evidence, but if we can't replicate this, then it's not going to hold weight, right? We could find um, material. We could find evidence. We could say this is happening. But when someone else tries to replicate it and it doesn't happen, it's going to fall out of that, that science. It's going to fall out of that, 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 um, that really validity. It's going to fall out of, of making a, a, a solid argument. So with reliability, can we replicate it? And then we're going to compare the work with others. So if somebody else goes to the same place you went and they don't uncover the evidence or what they find is totally different, you lose that reliability. So if you tell me that, um, you know, Getting back to that idea of gentrification, if you tell me that a place is gentrifying and somebody else goes in and says, no, th this isn't gentrification, this is um, incumbent redevelopment, the, the community isn't turning over, I'm finding this through, through census data, I'm finding this through real estate records, then you lose that argument. Um, so reliability means can somebody else replicate this? Can somebody else go to the community that you visited for your field report and find the same thing? If so, then you have a reliable argument. Um, so reliability tells us, yeah, you nailed it. We could repeat this, we could replicate it, or we need more study. Here are the weaknesses. Here are the flaws in that argument. So when reliability um, shakes out, 
we're going to know whether we can convince others that information is correct. Can we convince them that what you are saying, your valid argument, is correct? When we take a, a look at some examples that we've covered thus far, this term, we, we look at, um, first off, Zukin and production to consumption, right? She visited a number of cities. She's based out of New York City, but she, she visited a lot of different cities. So she had a number of examples to provide that objective evidence. She found that a shift from an economy based on manufacturing and heavy production to an economy based on consumption was found throughout the United States. And as a result, the physical landscape, the, the, the material uh, landscape, the buildings, the infrastructure, began to shift from sites of production to sites of consumption. So she was able to go to New York, she was able to go to Boston, she was able to go to Philadelphia, Baltimore, and have a number of examples that support her argument. So she was able to replicate them. She said that, that what I find here in New York is um, able to be replicated in these other cities. And she had the evidence, right? She had the evidence. She had the history, the historical information in place. She had the sites, so the physical examples themselves. She had the stats that shows a shift in workforce and um, an increase in um, wealth, increase in income of the, the new residents that are living in these areas that are now focused on consumption. So Zukin, she was able to hold up to, to validity and reliability. Richard Florida, who is a, um, a, a prominent 21st century author on gentrification, he made a simple argument. He said the creative class is what's driving change in these places, and that the creative class um, pursues locations with tolerance, social tolerance, um, a high level of, of acceptance for the gay community, the desire for amenity bundles, so things like walkable communities, gyms, shops, restaurants, boutiques, um, areas where individuals with a higher level of disposable income can have greater recreational opportunities and shopping and, and spending opportunities. So Florida, again, took some very simple ideas and was able to spread them over a number of cities. So we see how certain uh, cities in the Sun Belt are able to attract the creative class and how places that are hubs to um, our new economy, like Northern California, Seattle, uh, Boston, New York, they're also attracting the creative class and the creative class transforms places. So Florida too held up to validity and reliability. Jane Jacobs, somebody we've discussed at length, she just talked about trust and security and you know, her, her perspective was, was personal. So it took a lot more examples for her to build that reliability because Jane Jacobs, unlike Zukin in Florida, wasn't talking about a number of cities. She was talking about her small neighborhood, Greenwich Village in New York City, and how trust and security is found through different relationships. So, so Jacobs, rather than having, again, a number of examples, was able to, to build through the depth of local examples. And she was able to do so in an objective manner. Again, even though it was personal to her, even though it was her community, she was able to be objective in finding trust and security in relationships with, um, within her neighborhood group. And then the final example is Sasson, who talked about global cities. Again, she was looking worldwide. So the, the, the scope of her argument really needed to be well-defined. And what she looked at was, was how um, capitalism, primarily through financial networks, was transforming cities. And she found cities like New York, London, and Tokyo, the three examples of global cities, had very similar attributes. Um, it, it had, a, it had a, a workforce that was highly educated, high net worth individuals. And then what she said was that in these cities, we have a, shrink, a shrinking middle class and that our um, working class is growing bigger and our upper class is growing bigger and we're finding this in these global cities. Um, she also found that immigration was big. The, the global city served as pull factors. So we had a diverse workforce, again, but it was kind of polarizing where we had more at the top and more at the bottom with our middle class shrinking. And she was able to apply this, this approach and this, this evidence across a number of our key global cities. So these authors were able to show 
validity and reliability in their theories and with their supporting evidence.